I am, as Zoe said, um, working with Heather Fraser on this work. Um, and I'm, okay, I'm just going to go with the flow here. So first of all, um, I'm really interested in these kind of, in these two particular areas. So I'm a sociologist, which means I'm interested in power, I think. I think that's like the short version of what we sociologists do. Um, I'm interested in the way power manifests in society in, in various ways as expressed through our relationships with other animals. Um, and of course, you know, we have all the power is essentially what it really boils down to. And I'm interested in kind of looking at the ways and understanding how that manifests itself so that we can challenge it and hopefully change it. Hence the kind of, you know, the vegan stress and the politicized nature of the work that I do. Um, I'm interested in structural violence and oppression. Again, I'm a sociologist. It's what we do. Um, that doesn't mean I'm not interested in the cultural expressions because I think the cultural and the structural, um, they work in a circle, they support each other. So I'm interested in the idea of ideology and hegemony and how the kind of normalization of violence to animals in its broadest sense, I don't just mean in an interpersonal sense, but in its broadest sense, how all that is normalized and therefore um, considered acceptable. And as a part of this, which I don't actually see as as, in, as distinct, I'm interested in the politics of research. Um, so I'm really interested in, you know, why do we bother doing research? Is it just to um, tickle our own intellectual grey cells? Um, or is it to actually strive to make change? And for me, it's always been about the latter. Um, and so I'm interested in how do we do forms of research that don't compound the oppression of groups that are marginalized. And I will come back round to this ever so slightly towards the end. Um, and as an aside to that, I'm interested in how the neoliberal university affects research, which again, I don't think is distinct. They seem like they're two very different areas, but I don't think that they are. Um, I think the neoliberal university with its push towards conservative research, actually um, is quite alarming for those of us who want to do radical critique, and by radical I mean structural. So those of us who want to do structural critique and work with populations that essentially don't bring any money in. Um, I work with several people, but a lot of my work is done with Heather Fraser here with the beautiful Alice, um, which is not to say Heather's not beautiful, just to say that Alice is more beautiful because she's a dog, so. <laughs> um, and Heather is a social worker and her name is on this presentation because we worked it up together and we're working on the paper that sits behind it. Um, but Heather's not presenting with me today because she's not a sociologist. Um, but if she is here, she did say she'd be willing to take questions. So the work that we do together, um, we work within vegan feminist uh, research paradigms. Um, and what that means is that we do research about power and how it's linked to knowledge. So we we draw on the work of Susan Strager and Leslie Brown, um, who do work in Canada with Indigenous people. And they argue that research from the margins is not just about doing research on the marginalized, but it's research by, for, and with them. And this is where I think it gets tricky for us um, as, as sociologists who might want to study vegan issues and animal, uh, you know, an animal abuse in an intersectional way. How do we do that with them? But we need to keep figuring out ways to do it with them because if we exclude them, we silence them. We learned this from black feminists. Um, and so it's tricky, I think, for us because they are other species. But at the same time, given our kind of Western imperialism, the methods and the theories that we use currently underpin and legitimate the abuse that we're trying to end in the first place. And so for me, it's really important that we try and work around excluding animals when we do this kind of research. Um, so it's about what knowledge is produced and who's entitled to engage in these processes. And I know I'm speaking to the choir here, um, but, you know, we've got a long intellectual history of ignoring other animals and or uh, comparing them 
preparing their capabilities by benchmarking them to us. So I'm interested in designing research that's inclusive, that's, that doesn't visibilize, that doesn't invisibilize, um, and that attends to this notion of silencing marginal um, people or people and animals already in marginal positions. So intersectionality is interesting and useful to me. Um, my Probably my strongest theoretical interest um, and influence is through feminism, um, a, a particular form, particular forms of feminism. I borrow from all over the place, but it's the more radical structural critique, um, and particularly the idea of intersectionality that comes through black feminism, um, and that, of course, everybody knows about Kimberly Crenshaw's work, but the Kambahi River Collective statement was possibly one of the first to actually identify this notion of intersectionality without using that word. So they, they wrote a fairly famous manifesto in the 1970s, and, this, and they said in it, we believe that sexual politics under patriarchy is as pervasive in Black women's lives as are the politics of class and race. We also find it difficult to separate race from class, from sex oppression, because in our lives, they most often experience simultaneously. And now at the same time, uh, roughly, we also had the emergence of ecofeminism with ecofeminists talking about interconnected oppressions, which I think is also the basis for modern iterations of intersectionality, particularly as it applies, applies to the environment. But, and some of you may take issue with this, um, whereas ecofeminism started as a kind of political movement led by women of colour, um, usually indigenous women who were fighting to keep land, to keep food on their table, it kind of morphed when it hit the academy into white middle-class women's environmental feminism. Um, and I don't think for one minute it lost its radicality, but... Um, it lost something, I think, in that shake-up. But we can take from ecofeminism the idea that it's not just an ideology, not just theory, but it's also a social movement. It's a practice, it's praxis. Um, and it offers a political analysis that explores the links between androcentrism and environmental destruction, which is where we start to see these interconnected oppressions and where we start to see the beginner or the seeds of intersectionality or vegan intersectionality. I'm never sure whether we should keep using, hey Heather, <laughs> I'm never sure whether we should keep using the term intersectionality. There's a part of me that wonders about appropriation. Um, and I wonder whether interconnected oppressions is perhaps better or at least acknowledges the ecofeminist basis of a lot of critical animal studies, because a lot of the theorists in critical animal studies don't necessarily recognize that intellectual heritage, which is hugely problematic. So Corey, you might recognize this picture I took it from your website about e vegan intersectionality um the way that Heather and I use this is our central argument is that oppression and privilege also extend across lines of species and that's why intersectional ideas are useful to us so feminist discussions of power have to include discussions of the way that we treat other species not just because the species who are most, um, sorry, within within the species who are most abused, it tends to be the female of the species, um, but, but also just because it's another expression of the normalization of the violence and abuse that we see every day that manages um, to keep the marginalized, including other animals in their place. So to me, the strengths of this kind of an approach, and sorry about the picture, but I thought, you know, the dangers of eating raw meat. I mean, how, how let's go about normalizing cooked meat, shall we? Um, the strengths of, the, of this, of course, are that internet connected oppressions are seen as structural and we can analyze them on a structural level. Um, so, you know, the strength of such a view is that it's an inherently sociological one. It moves us away from the binary thinking of individual good versus evil, you know, so it's the bad apple who does violence to animal when it actually isn't. It's the everyday person who does violence to animals just by existing. 
um, and allows us to acknowledge the way that violence, again, used extremely broadly um, and abuse are embedded and often justified by social systems and their authorities. And to me, that's a very feminist point of view. You know, it picks up, and it's also a sociological point of view. It picks up on the work of, work of people like Dorothy Smith, um, who talk about the need to do institutional ethnography um, to work out how the ruling class keeps the non-ruling class down. And if we assume that the ruling class is humans and the non-ruling class is animals, then we can move on from there. It's also, the strength is it also changes the lens. Um, I'm sure that most of you, like me, are very tired of having to justify the fact that you are an academic who studies other animals. Um, whereas I think if we take intersectional veganism as a starting point, we don't necessarily have to do that, certainly amongst ourselves. And then we can get on with the theorizing that we need to do. Um, and I also think it's a window into people who might not want to think about racism or sexism, but do care about animals, because um, as John Powerson says here, you know, like once you've realised that um, the prevailing cultural norm is a lie, you start to question everything else. So in terms of challenging mainstream discourses, I'm just going to finish up very quickly with um, an example of how we kind of go about doing that. So this is from the Farmer Wellbeing Project, where Heather went and interviewed um, around 20 farmers, I think it was, Heather, um, in uh, all over Australia. Um, and we started thinking about how they thought about their animals, because most of them professed to love their animals. Um, and we thought, well, you know, they've, they've got this humane discourse where they talk about how they look after the welfare of their animals, they have a great life until that final last day and all the rest of it. But if we adopt this kind of intersectional lens that draws on an analysis of power, um, we can actually then start thinking about, well, this is about the logics of domestication. Um, it's an, an animal welfare, rather than actually challenging these ideas, it underscores them, you know, it underscores, it comes from a position of how can we keep the animal well in order to extract more from her body. Um, and so if we take the, this kind of political analysis, I think it lets us see um, the everyday differently. And seeing the everyday differently, of course, is, is one key to working out how we might challenge um, every day. So the kindness that farmers talked about, it rests upon, um, you know, there's like, a, there's a Foucauldian analysis here, I think, but it rests upon constructing the other as docile, as need of help, as it's the white savior, you know, that's the, it's, the, there are parallels here in terms um, of how, of how racism has been justified, how sexism has been justified. Um, and it fits neatly into these kind of humane paradigms in that animals are constructed as passive, just as black slaves were constructed as passive, just as women who should be kept in the kitchen were constructed as passive. So I think we can see how this, this intersectional theory of power um, allows us to go out in the field and actually analyze human animal relationships sociologically. Uh, I'm aware that I've got like a minute left, so I'm gonna be very quick. <laughs> um, I also think that one of the strengths of feminism um, and particularly intersectional feminism is that it lets us see animal relations differently. It lets us not just critique what is, but model what could be. Um, and so we have this feminist ethics of care, which is not necessarily about caring for animals, although it can be, but it's about caring about them and about their worlds and about their lives. And it's based on reciprocity, mutuality, respect, inclusion, um, all the good things in life, and it kicks out all the bad. And it also politicizes the idea of care. Hi, Corey, I'm nearly done. Um, and here's just an example of how you can see those alternative relations um, in, in action. Uh, when women make relationships with other animals um, that are very, very different. Little Hobo gets his own bed every night. And finally, I will just say very quickly, um, I can't just go without the method, the note on method. <laughs> we have to include other animals. If we exclude them, we silence them. 
Um, and, you know, our research choices are highly politicised, particularly in the neoliberal academy. And I think we need to be aware of that, open to it and willing to shout loudly and challenge it where we can. I'm good. 20 seconds over. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you, Nick. What a wonderful way to start the conference, really grounding us in some of those major questions and theories. I wonder if in the chat you can explain this picture. <laughs> I'm very curious. <laughs> this is actually a fairly famous story. So he did. He I put his cat's it. name. Um, he put his cat's name on the um, physics paper as one of the co-authors. And from memory, I think it's because oh, he did all his work with his cat in the room with him, and his cat helped him. But. Wait, uh, but this is my notes, right? Can you see my notes? Oh. Yeah. When you start the presentation, that'll go away though, right? Um, well, I thought it would. <laughs> Sorry. I don't know why it doesn't work. It worked before, so I don't know what's happening. I think if you go back and just start the presentation, it'll be fine. Yeah. We'll let you know. Do you see my hey, presentation now? That's it. Yay. That's it. Okay. <laughs> okay, great. All right. Sorry so we're about, about five minutes behind. So if you want to, you have until about five minutes after the hour, if that's okay. Yeah, sure. Okay. All right. My little well, face will pop I, up. I, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no worries about that. Sorry. I'll try to keep it within 15 minutes. Um, so hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Marlise. I'm a sociologist from Belgium, and I'm currently doing my PhD in Human Animal Studies at the New Zealand Center for Human Animal Studies and their supervision of Nick, who presented before me and any thoughts. Um, so today, so today I want to be talking a bit about my PG research, which focuses on purebred dog breeding practices in Aotearoa, New Zealand, and I focus in particular on a responsible breeding discourse. Um, so in my presentation today, I will um, be giving you a bit of background why I'm looking at this particular discourse, and also sharing, um, yeah, so I'm going about my research and sharing some first insights of interviews with uh, pedigree dog breeders. Um, this is still very much work in progress I am, as I'm still in the middle of my data collection phase. So it will be a bit like a short insight already in some of the data. Um, so I want to start off uh, by just uh, giving an overview of some of the welfare issues that are related to purebred dog breeding to show you kind of where this responsible breeding discourse comes from. So I identify five key welfare issues um, in Western societies. So the first is the very selective uh, breeding um, with too much attention to uh, specific and extreme physical attributes in purebred dogs that cause a lot of health problems in a lot of dog breeds. Uh, second issue is this kind of commercial breeding. So um, without doing any health testing or providing good socialization for puppies or breeders who really breed in large numbers and for profit mainly. Um, a third issue is kind of this show culture. So the way dogs are still judged according to confirmation to breed standards, where they still tend to focus on how the dog looks instead of uh, how healthy they are. Um, a fourth issue is um, that a lot of dogs are bred every year and a lot of them also get relinquished to animal shelters. So there's a lot of overpopulation in uh, many animal shelters, especially COVID-19, you saw that this issue kind of became worse. Um, and the last one is kind of misconceptions and stereotypes that uh, about purebred dogs. Um, so with the common assumption that breed is predictive of a dog's temperament and behavior. So as a response uh, to these kind of welfare concerns and as a counter movement to the uh, adopt on shop movement, kind of see there is a move towards responsible breeding or good breeding practices where kennel clubs and their breeders kind of call for saving the breeds they love so much by um, breeding away from genetic disorders and encouraging uh, responsible breeding practices. Um, so in Aotearoa, New Zealand, uh, this responsible breeding discourse mainly takes form through 
um, the Dogs New Zealand, which is the New Zealand Kennel Club uh, accredited breeder scheme, which kind of aims to encourage these good breeding practices and provides a bit more regulation on breeding uh, that breeders need to do some mandatory health testing before they start breeding from their dogs. Um, so I put these numbers in here to give you a kind of idea of how many breeders are part of this accredited breeder scheme. Uh, but this is an approximation because um, this list changes continuously. Um, so it's to give you an idea. So um, about 57 out of 260 registered breeders are part of this accredited breeder scheme. So not that many, about 22%. Um, and an interesting thing is to see is how many women are part of this, uh, are breeders and also part of this accredited breeder scheme. So about 89% uh, of accredited breeders are women. Um, so for my PhD research, I focus uh, on breeders who are part of this accredited breeder scheme to kind of critically explore uh, res this responsible breeding discourse in uh, New Zealand. Um, so my research has two aims. So I try to examine how dog breeders try to legitimize their breeding practices through a discourse of responsible breeding. So kind of looking also at how this discourse is embedded in broader normalization of animal welfare discourses. Um, while I'm also looking at uh, power and care dynamics, how to shape the interspecies relationships uh, within the context of these responsible breeding practices. So really looking at the complexities and nuances of power relations between uh, breeders and their dogs. So I um, use intersectionality as my main guiding analytical tool. And my research also integrates key aspects of several theoretical frameworks. As you see, there's a whole lot of them uh, that would help me extend such an intersectional analysis of power relations uh, within purebred dog breeding practices. So um, the results I will discuss today will focus more on the intersections of species, gender, and uh, breed power relations, uh, which will still be very basic as, um, yeah, I'm still in the middle of my data collection, but it's to give you already some insights in some of the complexities of these power relations within uh, responsible pedigree dog breeding practices. But before I go over some of the results, um, I want to give you a bit of an overview of the kind of methodological framework I use. So I employ uh, a species inclusive sensory ethnography research design uh, to also like include dogs as well. Um, and as part of this sensory ethnography, I am still doing feminist narrative interviews with breeders, uh, usually with our dog presence. Um, so my interviews were kind of conversational style interviews with a topic-based interview schedule instead of a semi-structured questionnaire. Um, and before, during, and after my interviews, also trying to attend to multiple senses. So not only uh, focusing on sound and vision, but also on smell, touch, and taste, especially when I'm reflecting on um, interactions with dogs. And lastly, I also, um, made use of pictures. Um, so I asked breeders and fans to send me pictures of their dogs um, that we then discussed during the interview. And I also took pictures when uh, I met uh, breeders and their dogs in person. Um, for an analytical framework, I plan to use intersectional feminist narrative analysis to kind of enable me to deconstruct this kind of discourse of responsible breeding and look at uh, consider how culture and social structures kind of surface in personal stories and also in relation to um, all these uh, different power relations. Um, now I want to focus on like two narratives uh, for this presentation that I found in my interviews. Um, so it will be, yeah, still very basic as I'm still doing my data collection. Uh, but the first narrative I want to focus on today is about pedigree breed value. So already looking at how breed is also relevant power relation uh, to consider in intersectionality, because as you see here from these quotes, dogs are strictly categorized and valued differently according to these human-made uh, breed categorizations. So here I'm looking at um, notions of breed purity of pedigree dogs. So as these quotes show, 
The value of pedigree dogs lies in having these uh, distinct, unique body features and typical temperament characteristics. Um, so, uh, yeah, as this first reader says, I believe in the value of pedigree because they're distinct from each other. And uh, as the second quote also shows, um, um, these threats make them special. And the second reader also uses kind of a, as a legitimation on why breeders think we should keep breeding uh, dogs according to breed standards. So pedigree dogs instead of uh, a crossbreed who doesn't have these predictable, special, ca unique characteristics that pedigree dogs do have. And these ideas of free purity are also linked to ideas of kind of this pure blood purity of lineage. Uh, so that's where um, pedigree is really valuable, according to these breeders, because you can uh, trace back uh, generations before. And it's also only after a certain amount of generations that dogs get that valuable pedigree sta status that is certified uh, by kennel clubs. Um, so this whole idea of what defines a certain dog breed is something that breeders want to preserve as this uh, second quote uh, talks about, and breeders want to preserve that breed that they love through their breeding practices, but also they want to improve the breed as a population make it and make the breed healthier to kind of like save the breed from these health issues that I mentioned before. But this improvement is still done mostly within the breed standard uh, of what is considered correct dog shape according um, to that breed. Um, yeah, so it's really about also predicting uh, the dog's temperament so that they can also live with people. And that's where I come to this third aspect of this narrative is that it's still framed in a human-centered way and that their value also lies in being able to suit humans different lifestyles so that um, humans can actually find their match out of these various breeds to find the dog breed that best fits their lives. Still in the second quote, you kind of also see that and this breeder talks about we should be doing what is best for the dog because they really care and love their dogs as well. So they do, uh, here she does take issue in uh, people uh, choosing a breed that looks cute. And there she says it's not fair for the dog um, so that they also consider the best home for the dog as well. But still it's uh, mainly about humans who decide what breed they want based on their lifestyle of, or preferences. So it's still uh, a lot about what humans want. Um, a second narrative I wanna focus on is narratives of reproductive labor and care work. And so this was also an important uh, narrative that came out of uh, my interviews. So looking a bit at gendering processes that happen in pedigree dog breeding. So looking at the intersection of species and gender. Um, and one way is through that uh, in dog breeding, um, we're also mainly targeting female dog bodies. And um, there's also a tendency to have a disproportional presence of female animals. Um, so this is also because dogs are still part of this societal structure of domestication. Um, that there is human domination and control over the reproduction of pedigree dogs through this very selective reading for human purposes still. So as this quote, for instance, indicates, um, the dogs basically don't have real choice in mating partners because it's chosen by the breeder. A lot of these dogs are also forcibly impregnated through artificial insemination. So as is mentioned in this quote, this breeder gets semen from overseas, from Australia, and this is something that is common, especially for rare breeds. Um, yeah. And a second part of this is also this uh, way of gendering uh, in the criteria for breeding. So dogs are also bred for characteristics, uh, characteristics which conform to patriarchal discourses of domestic femininity, such as good mothering here, for instance. So here you can see where this breeder talks about um, um, that breeding uh, to be, um, yeah, that it's important that they're, uh, that good mothers are bred from because they produce good mothers and poor mothers, as she says here at the end, there's no point breeding from poor moms because they will just produce poor moms. 
But in the middle, you can kind of see also how she's like um, also uh, considering like it's not really worth it for her dog as well to breed from her if she uh, doesn't like um, being a mother because yeah, she doesn't enjoy it. Um, so you can see, I do consider also um, whether they lock, their dog likes to be a mom or not. Some even uh, tries to um, tell before they decide to breed from the dog, whether their dog, they think their dog likes to be a mom. So there's some consideration also uh, for that. And lastly, another um, interesting part of this narrative is that the kind of historical construction of gender uh, are still at play in breeding practices. So uh, these traditional gender roles influence how so many women are involved in dog breeding. Uh, as you saw before, uh, like 89% uh, were of breeders were women. Uh, so you don't only see a disproportional presence of female dogs, but also of human women. So how care work still falls on both human women and female dogs as well. So here you can, for instance, see how this um, breeder is talking about uh, sexism that's still present in the work field nowadays. And women tend to, um, have tended to find more purpose and achievement in dog breeding that doesn't have that gender bias. And she also talks a bit about these family roles um, that are still present. So in the second quote, she talks about it's still a norm that women take time off work for kids when they have a career. And that kind of flows over into dog breeding as well. That, um, yeah, that kind of taking time off work to care for puppies and the mother dog. Um, yeah. So that was a bit, uh, yeah, some first results for me. Um, thank you for listening. Thank you so much. That was oof. It's a fascinating glimpse into a world that I did not know too much about. And although some of us think is very surprising, a lot of it is not surprising. Is a wonderful uh, feminist <laughs> sort of critique there. I'm sure people will love to pick that apart in the in the Q and A. Yeah, of Thank course, you. it was a very very thought provoking presentation. All right, next up, the illustrious Dr. Zoe Sutton. Is Alex with us this morning or evening there? Alex is with us. I think he's going to pop hey. in. For he is. Yeah, he's here. <laughs> I can hear him. Uh, <laughs> right. Uh, let's see if I can work the technology today. Okay. Can you see that? Yep. I'm just going to flick through it like this, if that's okay with everyone. You can see the little things on the side of what's coming. It's fine. So I guess you have to about 40 minutes after and then gives us 20 minutes for Q&A and a nice 30 minute comfort break, if that sounds good. Okay. I think you're on UK time, so I don't know what that time is, but I'm going to set a 15 well, that's minutes. That's right, because you're like that wonky, you're not like, Adelaide is in a different. That's okay. okay. I'm paying attention. And I set my... All right, I can do it. <laughs> uh, hello. Welcome. Thank you for dealing with my organization skills. Um. <clears throat> So I have a shocking cough that's going to be lovely for you all. But today I'm talking about a fairly new project that we're not very far through. So it's going to be a little bit of a work in progress report, but hopefully uh, it will give us some interesting things to talk about. And you can give us ideas because we love ideas. So this is something that we started this year. And I was interested in this project because I keep getting asked to work on these kinds of um like evaluation projects for a whole range of different home related human social issues, things around like homelessness and domestic violence and aging in place and even disaster preparation for people who live with companion animals. And something that's always bothered me when I think about home and home and humans and other animals is that we kind of in Western society and Western homekeeping, we have these little private parcels of land that we we take and we keep and we demarcate them for ourselves. And we don't often ask ourselves what our responsibilities are as kind of self-appointed caretakers of these little parcels of land, considering there are a lot of other beings who live on there. And particularly, I live on a street that is just one of those ones where they seem to be subdividing the whole street. So they're knocking down a lot of houses, they're cutting down a lot of trees, and they erect some new structure that I'm sure is great for humans. But I always wonder what happens to the animals who are in those spaces. Where do they go? 
Do we ever really think about them? What happens when you cut down a tree that birds are particularly attached to? What happens to the insects and the other beings who live in our homes and our gardens? And even when I'm digging in the garden, I just, I think about how many worms I've probably accidentally maimed while I'm doing something that's like gardening, that's supposed to be good for us as humans, but doesn't necessarily have a beneficial impact on everyone else who's already living there. So we're talking about multi-species homemaking. And this lovely picture that you can see there is actually my um my kitchen spider family, which is the cause of much discontent in my house because every time we have someone out to look at the plumbing or do any sort of cleaning, or even when we have people over to our house, I always have to ask them if they have a fear of spiders because we have a spider family who lives with us. And it didn't really occur to me that this was a problem until we get people to our house who aren't vegan and who are very pro-spider killing, how much it freaks people out when you very visibly create space for other animals in your homes and let them keep spaces that they've created for themselves. So um, when I think about this, I often think about my spider family and the, the chaos that they create with people who come here. All right, so today we're going to talk a little bit about uh, why we're looking at private home spaces. We're talking a little bit about beastly places and animalizing home, and then we're going to introduce you to the project that we are partway through, how much progress we've made and where we are going to go from there. So why are we looking at home? <clears throat> uh, we talked a little bit about home in the last vegan sociology conference. And home is a theme that's kind of come up in all of the research that I've done so far with humans and other animals. So when we look at home in sociology, home isn't just a place, it's also an emotional space. It's somewhere where you might do identity construction that you can fashion a place according to what you like and what you think defines you. It's a backstage place where you can feel comfortable and you can relax. But it's also a front stage place when people come over and you you like to create some sort of uh, environment that tells people something about you that communicates an identity that you are happy with. And it's also a site of power relations. So we know that there are a lot of human bodies and a lot of animal bodies who are excluded from home sites. And home is often a site of ableism. It's a site of racism. It's obviously a site of capitalism in terms of who gets to have a home, who gets to own a home, under what conditions you live in your home and who gets to make the conditions of your house. So particularly now we're looking at renting in Australia. And I think a lot about when you live in a home that isn't necessarily owned by you, as much as you might want to make it a vegan space and an animal inclusive space, there are limits that you can that that you can do that to. And we see these kind of conversations all of the time in our vegan groups where people say, you know, I would really like to ensure that these rat families get to keep living here or these birds get to stay here or these particular environments are maintained. But either my landlord's going to bring in an exterminator or I'm going to be evicted. And also we see sites of power relations in terms of domestic violence, uh, gender roles, and a whole range of other things, which is why I think this is a really good topic for our intersectionality conference this week. Now, sociological studies of home have been criticized for um, focusing too much on Western colonial narratives of home. And obviously, given the conference that I'm at, uh, we criticize them for being focused on human experiences. So it's not very often that we think about the other animals that live in our homes. And even when we do, which I'm gonna talk about in a little bit, um, we often just sort of mention animals. We might mention kind of how they interact with homes in a way that impacts us in some way. But there isn't a lot of discussion around what our home spaces might mean for other animals and how they might like to shape them and whether or not we could be doing something more to decenter humans in the space and create more lively, more beastly spaces, more inclusive spaces, even within very repressive confines of settler colonialism and anthroparchy and structural systemic domination which was my next point anyway, so I'm heading myself off. Um, so our reason for focusing on the physical space of private homes is because I think home offers us a really interesting opportunity now to, when I think about how we have intersecting systems of domination, and I always think about systems of domination rather than um, oppression being located in bodies when I, when I look at our anthropological society. And I think looking specifically at the physical space of a demarcated private home gives us this really interesting nexus where you can see all of these kinds of systems converge in a place that positions everybody in ways that aren't necessarily good. So we see this kind of nexus of capitalism around home ownership and the purchasing of land and the creation of land as a commodifiable place that you can purchase. And we see settler colonialism play out in that we, you know, I'm living in a, in a colonized country 
<clears throat> and I'm living on stolen land and that land has been stolen and taken by me and I've appointed myself some sort of owner over it, but I don't really think about my responsibilities. And it doesn't come with really any responsibilities and other than capitalist ones where I need to pay taxes and council rates, but um, but nothing really about responsibilities to the environment. It's a space of speciesism, obviously, because we're looking at human wants and needs being privileged over other animals in the natural environment. So he's a patriarchy. We see spaces of ableism. And all of these things happen right in this little home site. So I just thought, you know, I know in research, and I say this to my students all of the time, so I hope they're not watching this, but you usually want to make a really refined, defined research question that gives you something that you can look at in a lot of depth. And I think for this, what I wanted to do is kind of to go the opposite way. I thought I'm working on all of these tiny little bespoke projects that look at singular or kind of very particular experiences of homemaking. And instead, I want to make the thing I focus on the actual place itself, and then just consider all of the different power relations and all of the species and all of the interactions that might take place in it, and just see what we can do with kind of engaging with this mess. I love mess. I don't think we like it as researchers and we we need to kind of untangle it, but I think just like dredging out all of this kind of messy entanglement will give us something really interesting to work with that hopefully will help us take our scholarship forward a bit. Or you'll see me crying in the next conference because it didn't work, but we'll see. And my very practical my mo very practical motivation for doing this project is because I think being asked to to do different projects around human experiences of home, but particularly human pet experiences of home, gives us an opportunity for vegan sociological work to kind of trickle into mainstream spaces where we wouldn't necessarily be invited. And the way that I'm approaching this is because I think about when we don't account for other animals in space, to an extent, we, I mean, we dominate animals a lot, right? So often our solution, if we're, if we're in a human animal situation and it's not working, we have pretty deadly solutions where we just kill everyone and we don't have to think about what the consequences are. But I think increasingly when we look at what it means to have an inclusive home, what it means to have a safe home, what it means to create homes and support people in homes to age in place or live safely or live in kind of some sort of security, we're asking questions about what it means to create a good home space as much as we can. And I think this gives us an opportunity to start framing these things in terms of when we don't look at other animals, we create sites of conflict. We don't mean to, but we do. So if we start thinking about how to live with other animals so who aren't just companion animals, we'll create less conflicting spaces for everybody. We need to start thinking about how we live with others, how we live with non-human others, which suits my emancipatory vegan agenda. But I think it also suits us very well in the mainstream where really a lot of people just want to get along, right? So I'm hoping this project that, that probably sounds quite conservative gives us an opportunity to do some really radical work and to create kind of a pathway to start breadcrumbing more radical ideas into spaces that wouldn't normally take them. Anyway, <clears throat> so really this all boils down to needing to know what we do now in our home spaces with other animals, needing to know what we know now as scholars who study human animal spaces and thinking about what we might do differently in the future. Oh, and I just spent like 10 minutes on that. So we're gonna go real quick through the rest of it. Uh, Okay, so when we look at space, we have a bunch of scholarship in sociology that shows us non-human animals can and do demonstrate how they negotiate space and interaction. We know what's possible to study how animals interact with others in space and their preferences and what they might like to do. But we don't necessarily do this in ways that capture complexity. We don't always look at multiple categories of animal in the one project. So we don't look at kind of companion animals and pests and free living animals and insects all in the same project. And I'm hoping that doing so gives us an opportunity to start to capture some of those complex interactions a little bit more. So my main question that I'm focusing on is looking at what our responsibilities to other beings are who live in these home spaces. And the way that we're doing this is kind of a multi-part project where we're looking to systematically analyze animal-centric animal literature, uh, academic literature on homes and homemaking to try to get some best practice principles about you know, how we should probably structure our home spaces. So ideally, I'm going to be surveying the literature to find uh, some very practical things that we need to be doing, some benchmarks that we could be hitting when we look at spaces. As we would have talked about if I had time, um, what it's going to end up like, I think, is going to be a research agenda for how we might work towards developing that. So we have something we can tangibly give to people who create homes and create spaces so that they can do better work. 
And the second part is we're going to start mapping the stakeholders engaged in this. So do we look at animal behaviorists? Do we look at people involved in housing? Who are the people we want to contact to actually start bringing this into a practice setting rather than just uh, academic navel gazing? And what does it mean to start to bring this into policy so that we can do something around housing? Alex, do you want to spend one minute on methods? No pressure. I can try. Thank you very much, Zoe. <laughs> um, yes. So what the frick are we actually doing? So we're following Jan Watson's guidance on how to conduct systemic literature reviews, which essentially is just a type of literature review that is very, um, it's very exhaustive. So the first step was to develop these keywords that you can see at the top of the screen um, that were derived from the aims of the project. And we searched about four databases with those same words to come up with about 59,000 references in the end, which was um, quite a few, as you can probably imagine. We ended up deleting duplicates, articles without authors, um, extraneous um, formats, and that we, we were still having quite a few. We had 46,363 uh, in the end, as you can see here. Then we began the first past exclusions process. So we screened each article on EndNote by skimming the abstract and depending on whether that met the inclusion criteria, we sorted that article into a inclusions, maybe, or not relevant folder. So what was included? So specifically stuff on human homes and non-human animals or non-human animal homemaking or clashes between human and animal home spaces. Throughout this process, I've been taking my own notes and writing down some reflections. And in part, this was a break from the tedium of sorting 40,000 references, um, but it's also a really creative space, I think. Um, the complex space relations and species relations in my own backyard have been really interesting to me during this project. I've been thinking a lot about the wasps that are on my back porch and what's gonna happen to those wasps when the landlord comes um, after we move out and ostensibly tries to kill those wasps. I've been thinking about what the idea of home might look like between species. So migratory birds or tapeworms would be really interesting to look at there. I've been thinking about the complex relations um, in terms of how we interact with animals in our home. I think for the most part, we interact with non-alive animals or ghosts of animals. So in TV shows or movies or stuffed toys or pets or so on social media, animal emojis, memes um, or app icons, rest in peace, Twitter more so than the actual animals themselves. Um, and I've also been thinking about the extent to which animals pervade our language. So of the 40,000 references or so, there were so many articles on pet peeves or underdogs or Navy seals. Um, John Burge's essay comes to mind here. Uh, in the end, ultimately the screening process resulted in the numbers that you can see um, down the bottom here. And um, I'll hand over to Zoe, it's about a minute or so, two minutes. Thank you. You did very well under time constraints. And now Maggie's helping as well. Um, so we've got no, we've whittled it down now. We're only looking at articles that are specifically looking at private home spaces, but we've also kept aside any articles we found that had a broader definition of home that didn't necessarily subscribe to traditional Western one family, one household kind of housing. So here we have uh, human animal interactions in Aboriginal communities and town camps. Uh, villages who are bordering on kind of animal borderlands and what it meant to live in housing that was situated really close to those animal communities. And we're going to use those to inform our findings in the end as well. So very, very early emerging themes. Uh, you can see them up on the screen, which is that not many articles really consider how animals experience homescapes. So initially, we, I think, were a bit bullshit and we thought, oh, we're only going to look at articles that have animal-centered articles. We're not going to look at anything that's, you know, focused on pet kind of how pets are really good for humans and just has a little bit about homes. That's really not very many articles at all. And given that we wanted to get something very tangible and practical out of this review, uh, we expanded it so that if there was a mention of non-human animals interacting in home spaces, we, we kept those articles in. Most prevalent at the moment are looking at companion animals, pest management, domestic violence. That's kind of it. We don't see a lot of kind of positive articles looking at how our non-companion animals interact in home spaces. It's very much yeah, loved companions versus pests who are who are killed or otherwise negatively managed. We definitely see more articles around domination rather than negotiation of space. So it's very rare to find anything that's actually human animals negotiating a home space. It's usually human control over animals, even the companion animals in spaces. And often they're single species focused. So we've got a human and some sort of pet species. It's usually dogs. Um, the only thing that I really came across that had multiple species all of the time was looking at the interactions between free living cats and wild animals who were incurring on home spaces. 
And finally, as Alex said, um, it's not just in our homes that we really look at interacting with the ghosts of other animals, but when we're looking at how we do our sociological and human animal studies research, often these articles rarely deal with uh, like ethnographies with other animals or actual real material animal experiences. They're really relying on existing texts or media analysis, sometimes human testimonies, and it's very rare to see the animals themselves situated and included in the methods and, and the findings. So we're out of time. We're still working on our review. Uh, we're analyzing our articles as we speak. It's an exciting time. We're all riveted. And next we are going to be developing the research agenda I talked about, hopefully some benchmarks for multi-species homemaking that are less destructive and a little bit more inclusive. And uh, then we're going to start mapping our stakeholders and work towards future projects on how we might start to shape homes as a kind of heterotopic space where we can have less bad human-animal relations that hopefully will filter out from there. Thank you for your time. I hope that wasn't too quick. <laughs>